So, uh, first of all, maybe we just welcome uh, ourselves and welcome anyone who does end up listening to this. Um, do we want to just very quickly do introductions or a bit of background for just each of us? Um, yeah. Rich, do you want to get to start? Yeah, sure. Um, my name is Richard Bartlett. I come to this as someone who's like a um, pre-blockchain DAO person. So I've been working in decentralized organizations since 2011. And it's kind of like my main thing is how do we support more decentralized organizations? Meaning um, how do we work together in a way where the, the authority and the power is decentralized? And I started in, in, a, in a like technology mode, which with a company I co-founded called Lumio. And then I've gotten into more like organizational design group process stuff with a company called The Hum. And now my main like creative energy is around culture driven. So that's through a project called Micro Solidarity. It's like, how do we create the kind of relationships that support these kind of organizations to work really well? So they're like just kind of like different lenses into the question. They're all good lenses. I'm currently excited mostly about the cultural one, but I've just recently come back around to technology and it's like, oh, there's a thing called blockchain, Web3, crypto. And uh, what have I, you know, I, I feel like a, a kind of like a granddad in the scene in a way, like I've got something to offer, but I'm also got some probably out of date ideas. Uh, and I want to know how do I plug in and contribute something useful, some wisdom. And I want to know where am I just being grumpy and like, get off my lawn, you young kids. <laughs> That's kind of my perspective coming into this. What about you, Stephen? Hmm. Uh, well, once upon a time, I did work for an economics think tank called the New Economics Foundation. And uh I was thinking quite a lot about money, the nature of money, like whether it's possible to kind of rework capitalism for the good of people and planet and uh, kind of came to the conclusion that um, no, it's not really. And <laughs> instead I'm just going to um, pour my time into culture and cultural transformation with an organization called the Psychedelic Society, which at least started as a campaign for the legal regulation of psychedelic substances. Um, and then at some point was confronted with this growing organization. Okay, how, how should this organization actually be run? Um, that was kind of the context in which I've encountered Rich for the first time and just thinking about different ways of running organizations um, and became fascinated in this, this world of, of teal organizations, worker cooperatives and all the rest of it. Um, the, the Psychedelic Society well, is now part of a worker cooperative called Dandelion Collective. And my interests over the past couple of years have shifted actually kind of back away from psychedelics and cultural transformation, although it's certainly still kind of uh, involved in that side of things, and more back towards economics and technology, if you like, um, because of blockchain, because I thought, oh, wow, okay, there's something genuinely new and interesting here that it didn't really exist, certainly in, to anything like the same degree when I was last involved in this world in sort of 2010 era. Um, and uh, yeah, I just think there, uh, this, this technology presents some enormous opportunities for uh, coordination that, um, that we, sort of, we haven't really haven't had on the table before. Uh, but also requires a lot of the kind of uh, that or requires that cultural piece. And um, I'm super, I think this conversation is uh, hopefully going to be an interesting uh, investigation into uh, like how can we like marry these, these two worlds and, and uh, so that they can, yeah, improve each other. Wow, great. And well, I, I, my name's Rufus Pollock. Uh, I've I guess I've, I've been involved in several organizations, but I mean, uh, uh, the Open Knowledge Foundation, uh, which I found in 2004, uh, several others, um, Open Rights Group, but also now really, uh, well, a technology kind of startup called Datopian, but now really life itself, which uh, Rich uh, uh, and Stephen just mentioned, but I guess is really focused on, well, systems, uh, systems, how would we create a new paradigm? How would we transition from, uh, uh, to a new paradigm, but particularly focused maybe on the cultural and inner side, uh, though involving systems as well. Uh, we need inner and outer. Uh, but maybe just to say in my interest in this particular topic, so I have, I mean, things people have said, I've been very interested in distributed organization and kind of knowledge production. That's how I got involved in open knowledge. The, I got very excited about open source and web 1.0 really when I first 
at least the potential of it. I even remember in terms of community currencies, the first major event I ran, uh, which is in I think 2004, was called the World Summit on Free Information Infrastructures at Limehouse Town Hall. We had a community currency. Uh, they were very, in, in East London, they were very passionate about it. We had this community currency for the event and stuff. Um, so I met lots of people like that. Um, and at Open Knowledge, you know, I guess we're very interested in distributed systems for quite a long time, distributed databases and other things. Um, I knew I knew Zuko Wilcox of Zuko's, uh, Zuko's Triangle. I installed his system in, I think, 2008 for a distributed database system. Um, I lived in Berlin in 2014, so I met a lot of blockchain people. I went to the first Ethereum DevCon in London in November 2015, I think. So I've been around the area and uh, I'm really, I'm just really, I guess I'm, I'm a little, um, I'm very curious and excited to understand a bit more and to kind of kick the tires a bit. Um, having been around a lot of the promises of web 1.0, web 2.0 and so on, I'm a little bit, and think having come also from an economics background finally, where I did a lot of studying of game theory, mechanism design, institutional economics, um, and so on. I'm a little wary of some of the claims, but I'm like really intrigued and excited. And also kind of people I respect, like on this call, are like very excited. And that makes me really, you know, interested in, to talk and discuss. You've prepared some kind of framing yeah. for us, haven't you? So, uh, yeah, so let me come to the, that a little bit. Yeah, so one is a framing of, of the, 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 this kind of discussion, which if it goes well, we might do another one or so of them. But I think one is this, this is a kind of exercise also in collective sense making. We have three people around maybe with slightly different perspectives. One of the things we know in general in our world right now is that's how do we do that? How do we gauge in it? Particularly when we think it's quite complex. Blockchain is this new technology. And there's often a lot of polarization. You know, even here, blockchain is going to change the world or blockchain is a disaster and it's going to you know, eat up the environment or something. There's, there's a lot of polarization. So how do we... How do we do that kind of inquiry? And maybe it could be a model for that kind of thing. Um, there's this both, and as part of that, I think there's something that really resonated, uh, Richard mentioned just before we started, how do we bring a whole of ourselves to even these discussions? There's the intellectual part of us, the ideas, but also the embodied part, which is often where a lot of the, the polarization happens, you know, our, 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 in our hearts and, and bodies and our, our traumas and our allergies and our addictions and so on. So that's part of it. And I think this is well-intentioned people coming together in open-minded, rigorous inquiry. Um, and we're sort of, I think my proposal is that we go in a sort of Socratic dialogue where in a way, Stephen and Rich, I'm interviewing you asking questions. I'm, I'm the intelligent inter interlocutor, um, understanding to start with, I think what we're so excited about, what's, what's this possible, what's, you know, what's, what's the possibility? And then maybe getting to dig down a bit into that and, and examine it together. So I wondered, maybe you would come around. I mean, I don't know which one of you want to start, but I know, I mean, I, either one of you, maybe, maybe Richard, I know, because in a sense, you, you, you know, what is it you've kind of not, I wouldn't say, but you suddenly, you've got more excited about this in the last year, where Stephen's more of a, an old timer almost now in this space. And I know that in, in a way, and I'd like to come to it, that Stephen partly inspired you in you re-examining it, but maybe you could start by saying what, what drew you to it? What, what, what's excited you? Mm, good question. Um, I made a bunch of easy money. Um, on, on a, a, ran, a fairly random thoughtless investment that I made in a crypto project. Um, not that thoughtless, not that random, but um, there's a project called Holochain. I met some of the people involved. I liked the cut of their jib. They seemed like we had compatible values. And they did, well, I sort of thought, oh, they're doing a crowdfunding campaign. I want to support them. They've got this cool open source technology. And then I spent, I don't know, 200 bucks or 300 bucks or something supporting them and didn't really think twice about it. And then three years later, I kind of checked in on it and it was worth $50,000, which in my uh, context, having grown up uh, sort of on the verge of working class poverty, uh, 50 grand is like an unbelievably large amount of money <laughs> and triggered a quite pleasant but disturbing, you know, re-examination of my life priorities. Like, well, I've just made more money from a random roll of the dice than 
from the last year of working my ass off trying to do something that I care about. And it made me, you know, reevaluate what I'm up to. Um, and I wanted to be transparent about that because that's a significant factor that is driving the interest here is that there's this enormous inflow of capital and it's being distributed in quite a stochastic way that like people who have never had access to resources are suddenly like set, some of them set for life, but at least set for the next year or two, you know, that they've got creative freedom. And that really means something that, that's really like creating opportunities for people that like me, I had basically given up on the possibility of being a landowner, for example. And now it's like, oh, well, maybe that's enough for a deposit. You know, that it's, it's like, it's, there is like life-changing money being made uh, and it is a casino. That's, <laughs> so that's like, well, that's part of the context here. Yeah. And, and, and that um, made me sit up and pay attention. It's like, oh, how am I gonna manage this money? Oh, there's a whole crypto scene. So I learned about the financial side of things first. And then, yeah, Stephen did an interview with Joe Lightfoot, I think, um, and really in very explicit terms connected the history of the worker cooperative movement to the future of the DAO movement and, and the future of the platform cooperative movement. And it was just so obvious, but I'd never heard anyone quite say it that way. And as, as he was describing it, what I noticed in me was like, wow, I have really oversimplified the space uh to be a casino to be a like um kind of hype magnet to be a like kind of marketing bullshit vapid you know like i kind of categorized it as as this kind of meaningless thing and then oh i got some easy free money out of it and that was kind of the category i had it in and i was quite allergic basically to anyone that was ever talking about crypto and i had in my back pocket all of these quite um you know, easy to trot out criticisms like, oh, it uses a lot of carbon dioxide, uh, which is, yeah, it does. Anyone can call that out, um, but it doesn't, it doesn't kind of throw any light on the issue to just, just trot these skepticisms out. Yeah. Um, and kind of prompted by that, I just, yeah, I had the urge to, to take a second look, to feel like I'd been a bit overly dismissive and defensive and to, to sniff out, like, are there, are, there, are there other people out there that share my values and, have, and that I have a sense we're on the same kind of mission that have decided to exercise that mission in the crypto land? And as soon as I started looking for them, I found them. And uh, there are a lot. <laughs> there are a lot of people and projects that are doing stuff that I believe in. I don't know if any of them are going to be successful, but I trust their integrity and their... Um, yeah, like the, the, the drive behind it is a pro-social vision. It's like a world that works for everyone. And, and, and that's not the only thing that's happening in the space, but um, like if you take uh, Vitalik, for example, founder of Ethereum, reading him, I'm just like, this guy is a high integrity genius. And you can absolutely disagree with all kinds of his theories and his ideology, but he's, he's not a grifter, you know? Like he's, he's not an idiot, he's not evil. <laughs> that's one high, high kind of high power figure in the scene that's really, um, I think, showing up, trying to make a, a contribution. And then there's lots of other smaller projects around that. Yeah, this is great, this is great, this is great. It's obviously, when you look at it and you engage with it on the right terms, it's obvious that these people are doing something meaningful. Um, and yeah, once I started finding them, it's, it's, it's fun, it's just such a, it's such a thrill to be surrounded by people that are optimistic and constructive and to know that the capital is flowing towards them and that we can do experiments with like, hey, I've got this billion dollar treasury. What if we, I don't know, give access to six, 10,000 people to help decide on how to spend it? <laughs> like, well, it's just a fun kind of environment to be in. And it's kind of naive. It's a lot of people going through their first introduction to collective decision making and like a, a shallow kind of direct democracy. There's, it's so easy to poke holes in it. But what I noticed was, uh, I think this is uh, Jordan Hall's framing that, that there should be a generation of elders sitting around the campfire, uh, talking to the, to, the, to the crypto kitties and saying, hey, you know, we've been around the block before, here are some pitfalls to worry about. But instead there's just kind of like cynics that are, that are dismissing the whole thing. And so there's like a missing, there's a missing cohort of elders. And so I've, I'm, I'm really like 
I don't think I'm quite old enough to be an elder, but I've got some some miles on the clock. Relatively and, nowadays. Uh, <laughs> and I want to show up to just encourage this ideal, naive, enthusiastic, passionate development, you know, and um, and help steer it in a useful direction. And I just don't think it's particularly useful to, to arrive in a spirit of criticism. And since I've adopted that posture, I've been having a, a, a total blast. Um, I keep making magic money out of the magic money casino. That is another motivating factor. I want to just keep being transparent about that. Um, but it's just a more fun environment to be in than with the old cynical, like, take down everything. Oh, I can poke the holes in it. Like, okay, have fun poking the holes and stuff. We're over here building and it's, we're having a blast. Thank you, Rich. Yeah, great. Um, yeah, Stephen, do you want to add what? Yeah, what would you, I mean? You've got a lot. You, yeah, you've got a lot of context. I know I've I've listened. I think your pod your podcast with Joe and mm -hmm. yeah. Do you want to like kind of what would you want to add? And yeah, I, I just just one thing that you said, Rich, that like like really resonated with me. There was just this sense of this of optimism and this like can do positivity within the crypto space. And like sometimes it's kind of naive and goes too far but most of the time it's fucking great <laughs> in like and it's coming and I've been involved in a bunch of different activist movements over the past years I mean yeah at and then certainly there's you know a lot of them have been optimistic in in ways or at, at times um and but it's uh I mean let's pick one of the m m most recent like larger ones like extinction rebellion okay yeah yes there was a sense mm -hmm. in which it was positive and forward-looking, but just but it's in the name extinction. You know, it's like also there was a there was a lot of of doom and we're fucked in it. And like it's not just okay, maybe, maybe we are, but like the, the, it, in some, I mean, I'm not the first person to kind of um, uh, throw out this frame. I think it was, it was Mika White. Is that his name? The, the one of the people that was involved early on in, in Occupy um, has has said something like like blockchain is like activism or is, is is like kind of like post activism if you like and it's like we've in I, I it's in a way it's like we've we perhaps we've just we've onboarded we've uh we've accepted it assimilated that yes yes we're fucked yes <laughs> very you know like lots of things are very broken right now and like rather than like kind of explicitly worrying about those things we're just going to like pour as much energy as we possibly can in a direction which is yeah creative and and creative in a um on a particular level so i'll, go, I'll, I'll now go back a bit to something of my story which is yeah. um, as about as far as i got in working for, in the kind of traditional kind of activist ngo think tank world was um was was focusing on money i was very enthusiastic enthusiastic about a campaign group called positive money that were petitioning the government to like reform the bank of england to make to essentially move away from fractional reserve banking and towards something like a full reserve system which um seem, still seems like a very good idea to me um and uh but it, the government were totally disinterested and like this these poor these, these poor very dedicated like researchers and, and campaigners at positive money were just like banging their head on like sort of the, the door of the treasury and just getting nothing back um and uh that was a, that was kind yeah one one of my last areas of interest before i kind of was just like right fuck that like i'm just gonna look for <laughs> see if there are other ways to kind of affect change in the world which led me and um, towards psychedelics and that's another story but coming back to and, and well and it's it's a, it, there's a funny link i guess which is like i was using bitcoin to buy psychedelics that i'm, I'm sure were like legal in the jurisdictions and the times that i was buying them for for the record but um uh, from the dark net from very early on like 2011 um and, pay, and buying and paying in bitcoin so i was like aware of this bitcoin thing for um for, for some time but and for, okay this, kind of interesting but i guess i just i i assume maybe at some point people it would break or like you know something would happen which means oh, okay it's get not. regulated yeah it would get regulated or, <laughs> or something that but actually what happened is that um oh like, oh this is still going and not only is there bitcoin now but there's you know at the time well then it was like monero and and then it was ethereum and, and um but I, I probably the big um 
I didn't really take the time to understand Ethereum and the fact it could do Turing complete computation until like 20, uh, like 19, probably um, like early 2019. And I was like, oh shit. Okay. This is super interesting. Like, this is not just like kind of, I mean, I mean, don't get me wrong, Bitcoin by that time I was already like, okay, there's Bitcoin has real, um, there's something very powerful here, but the idea actually that you have this, this world computer um, that can actually um, perform computation in a decentralized way rather than just like shuffling balances around was um, took some time to sort of really sink in. But when it did, um, was was profound. And then uh, like Rich, um, I, I made a bunch of money like kind of mid 2019 um, in like one of the, the kind of first DAO hype cycle, not, like particularly on our project with Aragon, which is still a great project and still going. I mean, I've, a bit of downtime over the past couple of years but um and yeah so also to be transparent it was some financial benefit from from that project at the time that was one of the other incentives for, for making me sit up and, and take note um and then in the the last couple of years um i've been teaching courses i done an introduction to crypto and, and DeFi, um the promise of decentralization which is a bit more abstract and uh, and how to DAO. Um, and how to DAO is the most recent course that I've taught and, and DAOs are the area of the crypto and blockchain space that I'm by far the most interested and optimistic in, despite the fact it's becoming quite an overused <laughs> term now, but like, I think I still, I still, I still believe it means something. I can't be made to mean something like, um, precise and important. And mm. perhaps we'll get into some of that. Yeah. Okay. And so I guess my question, so. I, I don't know, in my reading, and I'm, I'm going to try and like kind of Iron Man, I like will see like what's the, I mean, there's a whole bunch that let's just put one on the table. Obviously it's just anything that has people somehow making funny money, casino like overnight and, and doing so quite a bit makes people sit up. Like I think all of your stories, this is kind of like you come across it um, and then you come across it again. And, and then at some point you make money. <laughs> um, so that has an, that, that's one thing, but I kind of, I think, um, you know that that's obviously there but let's leave that leaving that maybe aside for most so i mean that could be just one argument is if it were i mean somehow logically that can't work for the whole world right it, it, it's a bit like finance it is a zero in a pure sense bitcoin is a zero-sum game there's no that, that can't go on for the whole planet forever generating funny money for people it just won't it wouldn't kind of mathematically work i th i think i'm correct on that one but maybe i could be corrected on that but the thing i think more generally i hear from you guys is like that might have been the thing, but what really people are excited about, and when I when I read, it's like this is somehow the underlying is like we could have a fairer economy or a radically fairer economy, a radically more egalitarian, participatory economy. Um, we uh, we could we could we could kind of do corporatism uh, at a scale that was not before possible. We could address wicked pro collective action problems whether it's climate even physical ones such as climate change but maybe other ones such as how do we fund open source software or open protocols uh, or open information goods in general uh, art even in a way it's the people i hear who get evangelical and who are often themselves artists about nfts it's like you know rather than the unequal unfair traditional art marketplace in which kind of most artists starve and and even artists starve who their art gets sold for a million of dollars kind of we're going to have a fairer system so there's this kind of real sense of fairer uh, uh, but also sort of innovation in how we can work together uh, mm -hmm. and cooperate together and act together uh, across a range of, of, of issues um, I think the economy is is one but almost it relates to how we address climate change and these others I don't know are there other I mean I want to start and then I want to dig into those but are there kind of other major benefits that that i've missed before we kind of get into the detail maybe of some of those kind of potential changes or even that the fact that just could make people really wealthy or something but as a whole globally that i've missed i could say a couple of things i think um on the funny money point yes i don't believe that there's enough to go around for the whole world that everyone can get these like random uh, windfalls but part of the reason i wanted to be transparent is to say The reason this is interesting is because it's a it's a collective experiment and in incentivization. And me and Stephen have been incentivized to pay attention and not in our spare time, but in our 
you know, in our most productive energy of, of, of our working life. We don't have to do it on the weekends and evenings, I think. Um, all of these projects are thinking like, how do we actually pay people for contributing in a meaningful way? And that was not at all on the cards for any activist conversations I was having before that. So that is a significant appeal. And then the other appeal is, like I said, I've been interested in decentralized organizations for 10 years. And this just happens to be one of the attractor points where other people who are interested in that are showing up now and meeting each other and experimenting. And if it was the you know decentralized dog show club, I would go there. Um, but they happen to be in crypto. And um, that's just interesting to be able to find the others and to run experiments together because I want to live in a, in a society that's free of domination where people relate to each other in a spirit of yes. partnership. Like, let's get there. And yeah. we can't do it alone. We need to find the others. And that's where the others are at the moment. So that's just a benefit regardless of what the actual technology is doing or not doing. I'll pick up one phrase that you dropped near the beginning of that, which you said um, something like, you, you, you don't believe there is enough to go around. I mean, this is, I mean, uh, just to uh, just take that phrase in slightly different context, but like this idea that like um, there isn't enough money for everyone is super important because it's, 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 it is to it's nonsensical like money is <laughs> like a, a human constructed concept it's not something like it's not some kind of like physical constraint as you know studied physics I've, I've, I've been there i know there are certain you know conserved quantities in the universe and money is not one of them. money is something that we invent or at least we should invent to facilitate trade <laughs> you know free flow of goods and services and and like the flourishing and abundance of all human beings and indeed all life on this this planet as a higher order coordinating mechanism than simply barter and so like that's um uh this is the, the this this myth that there isn't enough money to go around is one of the key reasons why i'm involved in this space because like that's what's been put on us by successive governments I, I one big activist project for me was uk uncut and when this current conservative what well, is still the conservative government came into power in 2010 and and, and instituted this um uh this hot, extremely harsh austerity program saying sorry guys there's no money left <laughs> and so it's like what like but but hang on, you ultimately like control how much money is. And of course, there are, you know, yes, you, there are concerns about inflation and so on. But yes, um, yeah, yeah. Um, but um, the uh, the idea that um, uh, but, but but now, of course, we have we do have the possibility to, to to make money, to make our own money in a way which is decentralized and is secure and simply was not on the table as an option even really 10 years ago where and at that point the only option was to petition governments and say hey would you could you please change this economic policy or could you, could you please change this aspect of how money works and now and, and that's some of that work i think is still very useful and we should like we should still be doing that but there is now this other option of like well actually fuck them we're gonna like we're gonna create our own monetary systems on our own types of economy and not be restricted by the the lethargy um of of governments um in, mm. in, in this area and that to me is an extremely um exciting path yeah yeah and, I, and that kind of i don't necessarily say you are but that libertarian streak in this area is obviously a massive part there's a there's a general tendency to not in my experience there are very few people who love the state and it's in its and it's pure and it's and it's in its mechanisms but maybe i've missed them uh, but in but just to kind of so to come back what i've heard you both add is um well, I, well it's certainly used even just to come first is to say there's also an aspect that that maybe that there's kind of like quite there's even a more radical kind of frame breaking about what's possible um in in how our economy works so not just sort of fairer but we, you know what is money uh and the other one i heard richard was that sort of another benefit of this happening which is sort of i'd kind of class it um it, it sort of like the epiphenomenon is it's like just a way you're getting to meet lots of people who are interested in descent even if the whole crypto even if blockchain turned out to be like a complete technologically somehow just didn't work like i don't know somehow tomorrow in a puff of smoke you'd have got to meet like just to separate you've got to meet all these people who are interested in decentralized organizing who you want to get to work together and and, and kind of collaborate with so this is kind of a wonderful attractor point uh for people around a topic that you think is like a big crucial to us making a you know fairer i call it fairer freer world you know uh one with, without domination um okay I, so, I, I'll just go ahead. to add something on that like the you know fairer freer greener and all that like i i um 
I see those very much as hypotheticals and potentials yeah. in the blockchain yeah. space. And one, yeah. one other keen area of interest for me is uh, is, is token voting or coin voting. And like in many, mo many major crypto projects have so far replicated plutocracies. And there is still the case that like whoever, you know, it's possible simply to buy tokens and then whoever has the most tokens has the most votes. So essentially you can just buy votes. And like those kind of projects are, well, to be to like kind to them or to, optimistically, I can say like that they're, they're, they're bootstrapping the space. It's like, fine, maybe you need some of that to get this going. But like over the long term, they are like intensely disinteresting to me. And like, but 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 the fact is, they aren't the only thing you can do. You can, can indeed, you can indeed in, ha, and choose voting systems that are that do have fairness, equity, you know, sustainability, whatever it might be at, at its core. So just just. Um, and, and, and most projects, you know, most projects aren't currently voting in that, those ways. And I think it's I think it's an interesting question. And, you know, might even might, might even say like um, a uh, like a viable criticism of like, OK, you, you know, we, well, we say all these fairer voting systems are possible, not basically no projects are using them. So, like, how are we ex how exactly are we going to get from A to B or ensure that we don't just get stuck at A and have all this, yes. like, this, this all this like fairer, greener stuff simply as, as some um, hypothetical that is never actually achieved. But anyway, I may going getting ahead of myself a bit. I'm not sure getting ahead of, I think that's a great, a great point. I mean, where do we want to cause go? So, I mean, just to say, so one is, is this, just to summarize, this is the thesis, which is I think what gets people really excited and put the kind of, I don't want to say good about it, but the people, uh, it, it, the, the, there's this possibility of social kind of somehow social, social transformation or to experiment with social, social innovation in really crucial areas. Um, does anyone want to give like a concrete example of a project that they see, maybe we're not saying it's doing it yet, but it's kind of like, it exemplifies this kind of potential or excites you. I mean, Richard, you mentioned somebody, I know on the podcast also that, Stephen, you mentioned Panvala, um, I, I, but I just wondered, either of you guys want to illustrate an example of a project which you see is kind of in that way. Yeah, but I think for me by far the uh, best or like, examples partly by virtue it's like simplicity to grasp is the proof of humanity ubi project um which apparently is 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 big in argentina <laughs> so says um santi siri the, the founder on you know via twitter at least but um proof of humanity is a system for for verifying that a given ethereum wallet is owned by a unique human being and that's done by relatively straightforward means of just like standing in front of a camera and like reading out a message with some numbers and letters as people might already have done for various bank verifications and so on um and uh once you are verified as a unique human being in the registry you start being paid ubi tokens now um these ubi tokens um, which you get paid like every block so like every 10 seconds it's like just stream you can like click on your wallet and just see the kind of total like racking up it's pretty cool i mean they don't um necessarily have any exchange value um and uh but there are some, some uh philanthropists have seen hmm, mate, this is possibly one of the best ways of of instituting a global universal basic income and the universal basic income of course is a uh, project which has been pretty like hot over the past years and various governments have experimented with but um the crypto community too is experimenting with with the idea of, of, of this like global crypto based universal basic income and so philanthropists are now uh buying up these you know what might seem apparent you know apparently worthless ubi tokens to give them a value give them an exchange value and last i checked a, a month's worth of ubi streaming was worth around a hundred dollars which is like not like a massive deal in the west but it's a huge freaking deal in like lot in most parts of the world um so uh yeah the idea that we could have like a functional global universal basic income um, powered by ethereum i think is is one um very exciting possibility and uh, uh if you don't know uh santi siri and the work of proof of humanity anyone listening to this i highly recommend you go and check him and it out just just to check a question then for me an example on that so if if everyone on earth had a hundred dollars a month that's twelve hundred dollars times seven billion people seven billion people so so it's a, let's call it a thousand dollars a month so that's that's seven trillion dollars so let, let, uh, let me yeah. stop like um it's as as far as i understand it um yes the 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 vision is that like or the long-term vision is that um if this 
if, I mean, if we really get to the point where like the the majority of humanity is registered on proof of humanity and receiving UBI yes. tokens, then the dream is that they that UBI would become the new global reserve asset, and we would simply be denominating things in UBI tokens, transacting in UBI tokens. So the idea that it's like worth this many dollars or this many pounds would become slightly irrelevant. I, I got yeah. that, but I'm just trying to do the math now. So when you say it's worth $100, there can only be a certain number of people because seven, if, if all of humanity were receiving $100, if I can get these UBI tokens now, $7 trillion would be just under 10% of global GDP last year, which would be an enormous amount. So philanthropists haven't bought up $7 trillion of it, but what you're saying is the amount outstanding is this, I don't know, some 1,000 people currently well, there's only Yeah, there's only, I think, in order of tens of thousands of people on it right now, for sure. Okay, yeah. got, got it. So, okay, so but tens of thousands of people times a thousand would be like $10 million a year. Got, I got, and, I'm just trying to work it through in my mind. Mm -hmm, okay. got it, yeah. And let me add, even if the UBI token goes to $0 uh, and the UBI experiment doesn't work, the proof of humanity experiment is working. And that's a necessary building block of having a democratic system where you have one person, one vote. Mm -hmm. So even if that half of the project is a complete waste of time, having this, it's like a necessary building block. And I also wanted to name another project, Gitcoin. And the, the theory behind Gitcoin from the, from the perspective of Viterik Buterin, he thinks, and I am not at all convinced of this because I don't understand math the way he does, but he thinks that he's got a solution to the, to the tragedy of the commons. Yes. And it's called quadratic funding, which yes. is like, the way we do things at the moment is everyone's dollar is worth the same. And he's saying, well, what if instead of everyone's the same, it's that you, if you are making a contribution to the commons, one person contributing $100 should be worth less than 100 people contributing $1. So yes. that's, this is called quadratic funding. It's the model that they use for Gitcoin. Gitcoin supports all kinds of open source projects to all get paid yes. to, to, make, to make free software. Yeah. And so if you have got a community of thousands of supporters that are making small donations, that's worth a whole lot more than one person making a large contribution because it indicates there's like this very large community of people that depend on it. And that again, it's like maybe that doesn't solve the tragedy of the commons, but it is currently piping a huge amount of money to people to build free software that they're giving away to the commons. It's a really good thing. And it's an experiment with a different voting mechanism. It's a different form of democracy. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just, well, just, I think, I'm not sure you mentioned the, the, like the match funding part there, Rich, but that's, that's really not, important. <laughs> yeah. That's an important part. Yeah. I don't know whether you want to. Yeah. So that's, thanks for, thanks for noticing that. So like all of the people in the community make their small donations and then the Gitcoin has this big philanthropic bag of money that they allocate. And they allocate based on this quadratic terms. So a larger, a larger number of small yeah. donations is worth exponentially more than a single donation. So, so I mean, what I find interesting, maybe I could just build like so when I, I wrote a book called The Open Revolution, and it was published in 2018. I wrote it really in 2014, 2015, 2016. But um like where I came from in open knowledge was my dream was, and I'll, I'll come to even the limitation of that dream, but the dream was that our, in, kind of crudely put, we're going to move into an information age. We're going to move from the world of atoms to bits. Most of the stuff we're going to produce and, and trade and consume will be, you know, music, movies, medicines, which are actually mainly made of information in terms of the formula that makes up the medicine, you know, software, you name it, even the design of the chair you're sitting on or the computer you're running, it's a physical thing. Uh, but even the design of the computer is information and certainly the software, et cetera. That we all get, I think. And then the second part was um, information is costlessly copyable. Uh, this is the difference about information compared to atoms. And that's amazing, right? It means uh, we, you know, the, uh, the, the kind of uh, the loaves and the fishes uh, of if those of us who are, you know, have, a, you know, the, the, the miracle of the loaves and the fishes uh, where Jesus fed the 5,000 with, you know, five loaves and five fishes happens every single freaking day. Like we, millions of people can watch YouTube and it, and, and it can work. We can't click a button and have a house or a Ferrari or I don't know, even, I don't know, a bicycle even necessarily for every person in the world. We can't just click a button and do that. And the question that fascinated me was then, like that was my dream from the beginning of open knowledge. It's like, this allows a radically freer, but I mean, fairer, more egalitarian world. We should have open information for everyone. And so my dream has always been, I want to, other than your private information, your, your private photos, et cetera, 
I want all information to be open. I wanted it to be open for anyone to use, build on, et cetera. That was, that was the dream from the beginning of open knowledge. And I thought was the radical difference in the information age, the single big change. Um, and in, in a way I've often put it that socialism and capitalism could have a baby. You, you could kind of, you could have the, the open access, every, you know, to each according to their needs in that sense. There could be unlimited, everyone could have access to information goods, uh, including that like medicine, things which embody information. Um, but, you know, at the same time, and I'll come to that, we need some way. The issue is you have to pay for information. I, I mentioned all this in the lead up to say, how do you pay for information goods? They are a classic public good. Um, they're slightly different in their not they're non-rivalrous rather than rival as 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 like the atmosphere is. So they they get underproduced versus overconsumed. The information and Gitcoin, the reason I mention this is Gitcoin is a process to fund. Uh, I, I know the project now relatively a little bit well. Um, but in the open revolution, I, I went in quite a bit of detail of the different mechanisms. So, so you have two problems in funding information goods, uh, in a way. So you have a collecting the money problem, and you have a distribution problem or, or challenge, let me put it that way. And so one challenge, and, and in the book, I went through various options of how we can give out money. For inf Imagine we've collected a pot of money. We could do it in terms of use, like crudely Spotify. We'll give you money based on the number of plays of your music whether we like how much money Spotify gives to artists or not it, it is similar to the old itunes model or whatever how many plays how many downloads you had determines what you get we could have a voting mechanism we could have x factor people will vote you could do x factor with quadratic voting <laughs> you know but i went through the book there are various mechanisms you can design I would say the more interesting ones and i'll get to this which is very exciting about information age which are old systems of measuring value which was the sort of price system, which was very, very imperfect, but had also, it was like democracy, the worst except for many of the others. But it, it I mean, because many have been proposed over the years, um, but basically you want, ultimately you'd like to distribute in basis of value. That's what you'd really like to. And to give you a concrete illustration of that, imagine we want to fund the medicines. Imagine we want to give money out to pharmaceutical innovation. People, and the medicines are gonna be free then. I mean. Maybe not, they cost something to produce, but they, the, the, the recipe is free. How should we decide what money we give out to the different research teams and what they've produced? We could do it based on usage, but the thing might be is that Viagra might get more money in that system than some incredible cancer drug that only treats 100,000 people, even though it saves their lives. So there's an issue of simply paying on quantity. So you'd like to pay on real value. How, what's value? One approximation in the healthcare domain is quality adjusted life years, qualies it's called. But you know, you estimate for any given medicine, how many life years is this gonna save? How many people are gonna take, use this medicine or this drug and how many, how many years of their life is it gonna help them with, including disability and things like that. Um, and we even have that data, by the way, in medicine because people have to do pharmaceutical trials when they get approved for their drug and so on. So I spent quite a lot of time thinking about these mechanisms. And the thing is that the mechanism problem is interesting. And for example, in software, it's quite a lot trickier. How do you measure the value of software? And I've put quite a lot of all data, which was another error, right, you know, paying for the production of data. Um, and, and I've, you know, I, I could go into it. It's one area where the blockchain might be useful a little bit is in, is in tracking usage and tracking uh, uh, and, and tracking value. But I just want to emphasize these two different problems. One is an allocation problem, which is designing a mechanism to give out how you allocate resource when you have it. And we don't need to think of it in terms of money. You, you could think of it as bushels of corn or whatever you want. We could kind of forget the money problem for a moment. And the other is having those resources in the first place. And I, this is where I'm just, maybe I'm coming in a little bit. This is that I kept getting asked when I wrote through every, I went around giving talks for a few years between 2015 and 2018, and I'd increasingly get asked about the blockchain. Uh, like, how did this relate? And my point was like to say, well, not that much of the time, because I was like, well, other than on the allocation part, where I'm still dubious about its, its relevance, because it's not a very efficient distributed database for that matter. Um, the main problem we have in information goods is raising the money and the free rider problem. Now, there is a connection, just to say, between your allocation mechanism and raising money. If, you, if my allocation mechanism is patently unfair, 
then I might not have very much uh, voluntary contribution. <laughs> if, for example, the mechanism is roofers get to decide where all the money goes, Richard and Stephen might not feel very happy about contributing to the innovation fund that Rufus is running. <laughs> Whereas if we all equally run it, we might feel better about participating. So there is some connection between allocation mechanisms and the kind of the public goods funding problem. But fundamentally, it's the money raising problem that interested me in, in information goods. That was the, the, the clear obvious thing was that open source and open knowledge goods didn't seem to be well funded. That, that seemed, there were all these examples of bugs that didn't get fixed because some developer was maintaining some crucial piece of internet software in their spare time. Um, the, the issue I'm still trying to get when I've read about Gitcoin and even interacted with its developer is I don't, I, and I have a hypothesis I'll come to, but I don't really get how it solves the funding problem, the, and in particular the free rider problem. The reason that public goods funding collapses it, it potentially is because it's voluntary. And I can then sit there, we're gonna all of us fund some useful piece of software. And I go, guess what? If Stephen and Richard pay for it, I don't need to. And we've all read, that there's, they even have a very nice game theory illustration on kernel.community. I know a lovely link to this woman's page. This is the public goods problem, and this is why there's all this 3-3 and game theory stuff. But I haven't seen anywhere in this community that really answers that question, because what you have in normal life is you have the state, and the state is a solving a public goods problem. It's going to make you pay taxes. And therefore, I actually like that because it means I'll pay my taxes, and you will too, and we'll get useful collective goods that we might want. Now, I have one answer to this based on the conversation I had so far. And I think the story goes something like this. In a state, we bundle two things sort of together that you want. You want to live in this state. You want to go and live in America, or you want to live in New Zealand, or you want to live in England. And there's a kind of a deal here. You'll come live here and get the benefits of these things, but in exchange, you're going to obey the rules which include paying taxes. So we've kind of bundled two things we'd like together. There might be some things we don't like, like the bureaucracy is inefficient or whatever, but that's sort of the deal. And in a perfect anarchist paradise, I'd also have some outside option that was plausible where I could go live somewhere else and start my own society if I didn't like the rules here. The answer in Ethereum or others, as I understand it, though they haven't really worked this out fully, is that Ethereum will take over the world. And at some point, everything I want to do online will involve interaction with this blockchain. At that point, so let's take an example. So imagine on the blockchain there's some DAO that's funding might the piece of software we want to fund. And imagine that I act as a free rider. I come and join it, but then I leave and don't make my contribution. Essentially, I'll get kicked out of the DAO by the rules that have been written because I'm not contributing in whatever way I was supposed to. And I will therefore be excluded from access. If I try and run this piece of software somewhere else on the blockchain, the blockchain will say, wait, you don't have permission to do this because you didn't contribute to the DAO. Now, what I don't understand for the libertarians out there is that sounds pretty coercive to me. Um, when, you know, and I don't mind that, I, I completely get that, but it, and it, but it seems to me like the logical idea. And it's an idea that would only work when Ethereum has, or some other blockchain layer has such a level of penetration in, in, the, in the world that I have to use it. And at that point, if I don't contribute to this DAO, I won't not. Now, the other day I was talking to someone, they can remain anonymous. And we were talking about funding, I'm gonna finish this point, but they were funding even about cleaning up the ocean with a DAO. And I was like, so what happens if I don't contribute to this DAO? Would it be like I turn up at the beach and there's like a beach access software and it says, hey, Rufus, you didn't contribute to the plastic cleanup in the ocean DAO sufficiently. Burp, you're not allowed to go on the beach. Or now his answer more plausibly was like, no, no, that won't happen. What will happen is there'll be some kind of reputational system where maybe you didn't clean up the ocean, but maybe you helped build the trees in the forest. And so the reputation from the DAO kind of rebuild the forest DAO will kind of aggregate with my reputation across various different DAOs. And I'll have enough DAO credit that I can go to the ocean today. Now, I like that answer because I think it's at least honest that ultimately you need some form of coercion or the threat of coercion to make, to solve free rider problems. That, that, that is the Moloch problem that we all know and we know from basic game theory. But I'm just trying to check in with you guys. Is that your understanding of the ultimate answer about how Gitcoin's going to get to any scale? Because when I was a little bit, I got in a bit of a tiff, unfortunately, with the Gitcoin guy, because I was like, 
I'm not very convinced by the fact that you've got 35 million in magic money, that this can in any way scale to the level of R&D that the current world does for software, which is like on the order of trillions. Um, how are you going to solve the free rider problem then? Um, but I'm just trying, is that your guys' understanding of how we solve the free rider part, i.e. we get to scale on public goods funding? I, I want to give the dumb answer and then Stephen's going to give the smart answer. Um, well, first to concede, I think you're absolutely right that the free rider problem is the hard problem and we're insulated from it so long as we're in a bear market where there's easy money flowing around and people are like, oh, I'll contribute to that. Absolutely. Like, I just made a million dollars. I'll give you a $10,000 grant and feel like the champion of the world. You know, like that's absolutely uh, where the momentum comes for a lot of the public goods funding at the moment. Um, so the, the free rider problem needs to be confronted and dealt with, and I don't know precisely how to do it. This is why I'm hoping Stephen's is going to like nail it. But I do want to give the example of, thank this is a class of, an, an instance of the class of coordination problems. We've got all these people that, they would all love to have the clean ocean, but we haven't figured out quite how to get the system right, so we've got a dirty ocean. 15 years ago, maybe even more, I was an open source hardware hacker and I was inventing machines and putting the information online and saying, look, this is my research. This is what I've come up with. Other people can build on it. It was extremely hard to find other people. There were some that I could connect with through, through websites to find who else was doing that. Um, and it, I couldn't figure out how to monetize it. So I had to find other things. So I wound up like teaching electronic hardware design and stuff like that. Like, I couldn't sell the objects for enough money. At least I could abstract and, and find a way to, to keep a living going to go now. Now, coming back at the problem 15 years later, because of the combination of YouTube and Patreon, there are so many people in the same field that are getting paid really good money to produce open source hardware. And it's a, it's a legitimate career choice to say, I'm going to produce stuff, I'm going to put it on YouTube, I'm going to have a Patreon, people are going to pay me. And that's because the coordination problem has been improved. So, so the reason that you've got such a lack of philanthropic money is because people are like, if your choice is I'm going to go work at Apple and get paid really good money, or I'm going to work on this public good thing and get paid bugger all. Like, well, of course, a lot of people are going to have to choose Apple. Yes. But as we improve the efficiency of the coordination systems, that more accurately reflect people's actual values, like the, the values matches the actual value flow, then there's gonna be more money available for the public goods and it won't be such a hard trade off It's like, well, I'm gonna work on the thing that I care about. And it's not just me that cares about it. There's all these other people that care about it and a very efficient system for taking a small tax out of them. Stephen, what were you thinking? I'm sure it was um, more uh, rigorous. Uh, kind of related in a way, but um, uh, I think, your your frame rufus was um, was a bit too um uh punitive coercive or uh, you you miss the, the the happier side of things which is many projects that are funded through gitcoin at some point release tokens and airdrop tokens to the people that have donated via gitcoin and this yeah. is sufficiently well known now that that is at least part of motivation for people in, in making these donations thinking that like it's not going to happen every time but you know like if one in every 10 projects that I donate to, I end up actually getting like very significant token windfall, then um, I might, <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, I might have actually made more money than I've donated. So, and Gitcoin don't like to talk about this themselves because um, it would, it would understandably like kind of like change the flavor. They want people to be donating yeah. to the projects they actually yeah. feel like are most useful, actually providing the most public good. But the, the, it is the kind of like a, uh, if you scratch the surface, you find that actually, yeah, people are in, on some level, at least hoping, if not expecting that they will receive, like re they will be rewarded financially and, you know, at least yeah. financially, maybe in other ways as well, um, through having made those donations. And that's, that is an important dynamic. And like, in, in a way it's, um, uh, can I just check about how does that yeah. relate to the public good, the free rider problem? Because that's sort of just if I'm if I was a little bit critic like I'd be like that's just the Ponzi scheme in ma in motion that hasn't ended yet because that's just like people getting more tokens that that at some point may or may not expire what, like like just to go back how what happens at some point they're like sort of raising philanthropic money essentially or don't like largely donations get coin and my question is how does that 
how does that scale like close to the level that one wants? You know, I guess also, let me talk for a personal story. I've built a lot of open source software uh, per, per, personally now. And I've even built a company around open source software called CCAN. And it, it is a really real problem for that project. Like at the beginning, people just took the software and started bidding against us on government contracts who contributed nothing to the project, who never really contributed back much. And I'm not, I'm not, and I'm not really good at, I'm not, you know, and we were up against competitors who took $50 million in VC and had, like I was at one point, like I remember when it was going tough in like 2013, 2014, turning up at like, uh, like bid meetings, like the other team would have like built an entire demo, you know, they had three sales guys in the meeting and it was like me, you know, and I'm doing it my spare time. You know, I, I kind of watched free rider stuff in action for me uh, on open source projects. And that that isn't alone. Like you can, I studied it, but I mean, you can generally count on the fingers of like one mutilated hand, often the projects which did pure open source, that didn't do open core, that didn't do some other shenanigans like stuff. I'm not criticizing them that actually have made it, you know, in any, in any significant way. So I'm just trying to like, I've just got a very real and visceral experience of the free rider problem in action and plus all the historical record of, of mm. it. Now, I'm not saying we don't solve it. I'm just still trying to get in this space where they often, there's a lot of focus on the allocation mechanisms, like token vote and all that stuff. I'm like, how do you raise the money? Now at the moment, if I were like, I'd be like, what's going on at the moment is there's just some incredible gold rush combined with Ponzi scheme going on in the sense things are getting paid out of there's constantly issuing of tokens that kind of at the moment appreciate value and in some partly because people also engage in fractional banking like there's a lot of leverage which goes on as now I understand it in certain projects um, but it's like I, I just I, I mean I'm just sitting there going like okay but at some point that has to cash out into into numbers you know even to take another example Bitcoin Bitcoin could appreciate I don't know 10 times from where it was I can't see it appreciating like a thousand times more. At that point, it would be equivalent to like global GDP or something like that. You know, it would be, it would be like, and that's dri that that drives some of this. But I, I'm just trying to go back. It's like, how do we actually address the free rider problem at a scale when we get to any real scale? Yeah, that's what I, I and I, I'm like really open mind. I'm just like that would be incredible. That's what I've dreamed my whole life of working life about. You know, <laughs> I'm like. That would be right. You know, I'd just be like, I, my mind would be blown. I'd be so happy. So one piece which feels important to me is the fact that whilst it's very easy to uh, clone, copy, duplicate code, it's difficult, if not impossible, to clone community. And that is an important uh, part of the valuation of many crypto and blockchain projects. Um, and that may be, and it may be something different to in the kind of crypto open source projects, the traditional open source projects where there wasn't so much of a sense of like community belonging even around that, that project. Um, and yeah, I'm just going to like drop that in there just in case that's, that, that feels relevant or something you want to riff off, Rich. Uh, I wanted to add a couple of things. One is, yes. um, I don't think a Ponzi scheme is a serious uh, logical object that we're using to interrogate uh, with. I think any any new economic system that involves a lot of people uh, rushing in is going to, like almost any new economic system is going to look like a Ponzi scheme at the start. So just because it has some resemblance to a Ponzi, I don't think it's, it's a sound critique and like we have to get into more. Okay, I should into more it's detail a, it's a trigger, a, a trigger. we could go in a little bit more detail but i, like, I, I take it back i take yeah. it back for now for this and and a lot of me and my crypto friends are quite happy to be in ponzi schemes as well like that's some that's also what we're doing but this <laughs> it's yeah it's it's thrown around i think too readily okay um i had another point but it has slipped my mind i take a breath instead uh, uh, maybe let's just um oh, oh go ahead <laughs> the train of thought has returned from its tunnel here it mm -hmm. is um i guess the thing is yes the free rider problem is tough yes the need to fund public goods is crucial i mean especially if you think about the public good of the atmosphere and what we're doing with carbon and what kind of funding is required to decarbonize the atmosphere now my big question is where do you see a critical mass of talented people with time and capital running experiments 
rigorously testing their hypothesis about how we solve the free rider problem. Like where in the world do you find those people? And increasingly they're in the crypto space. And it seems to me like really incomprehensible that anyone that really cares about that problem would be dismissive and you have not been dismissive. So don't get me wrong. I yeah, think yeah. it's really great how you're engaging with it with an open kind of criticism. Um, uh, but the defensive criticism that I've met a lot online just doesn't, it just doesn't add up. It's like people are getting paid to, to, to work on this problem. You care about this problem. Come on in and get paid. Come and build with us. We're figuring this out. Um, so I guess, I guess maybe the question to you, Rufus, is like, from what you've seen so far, does it yes. seem like an inviting space to come in and, and contribute your curiosity and your intelligence? Or do you have a kind of lingering suspicion that's like, oh, this just doesn't, this just doesn't add up. I don't think it's the right place to be. I think this is a big distraction and we should be looking somewhere else. Well, I don't want to close that. Out. I could answer that question. I think maybe I kind of, so let's just take an example there. I kind of asked this question to you guys and I'm still checking of like, so how does, the, so one answer I've heard, if I think I get it right, is simply one answer from Stephen was sort of like, well, it, that, let's say you take Gitcoin as an example. It's a bit, it could be like, in a way, it could be like a more interesting answer, which is say, it's not, um, it's not philanthropy. It's sort of like people are sort of like it's a semi kind of semi investment, semi philanthropy or 90% philanthropy, 10% investment model. Um, the, 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 um, the thing, like just if I would say, it's, I don't get how that addresses the free rider problem, which is if it were truly, the thing is you're making club goods, you're not making public goods. I'll come to another question I actually have about this versus open source. The question you've also said, uh, I hear Rich is to say like, um, there are lots of people experimenting. And the thing I guess I'm saying at the moment is I haven't seen, um, I haven't, and I try to set out an answer, like my best Iron Man answer, which is say, no, the way, the, and I kind of got this from a, a little bit from another call with someone uh, who's quite pro uh, Web3 and stuff, was saying, Lord of like, that's what will happen. Like you'll end up needing to be part of sort of Ethereum. And if you're not contributing, and they, they even were like quite amazing. Like I thought they were very authentic in a way. They would say like, it will be a good version of what the Chinese Communist Party have. Like Chinese Communist Party have this like, you know, you, whatever your social credit score, but it will be a democrat democratic one. And I think they're sort of right, actually, that if you want to, if you think that people are going to have to participate and you're going to solve the free rider problem, like, no, so far you need some kind of stuff. Like, I, I don't know, I always go back, there's a story about the kibbutz. Like, I'm a big fan of kibbutzes. I'm really fascinated by kibbutzes, which I don't know if people probably all here know, but we're like the one kind of demonstration of like small scale democratic communalism or socialism that have been super successful. Uh, in, in Israel um, and were super successful. They accounted for over 10% of Israeli GDP at their peak. They, they kind of, most, many of the leaders of post-independence Israel were for kibbutzes. You know, they're incredible places. Um, and there's a story about a kibbutz I like. It's like 1949, a guy comes to a kibbutz and they say he didn't really work. He didn't really work in the orange orchard. So on the first, second night, people would not speak to him in the dining hall. On the fifth night, they would not speak to him in the dining hall. On the seventh night, he left. And their point was they were dealing with the free rider problem. They were dealing with someone who wasn't contributing in the kibbutz adequately. And if they didn't deal with that, they weren't nasty people and they wanted people to be looked after. But if they didn't deal with that problem, kibbutzes would in general collapse. Um, you know, and, and, I, and I, I'm saying, I, I, I think that there's a, bunch, and I, I, sorry, I should mention one other point. There are things Richard pointed out. The other point you had was, and it's actually in a paper, like what I love here, it's an economic paper I did write when I was trying to explain how open information goods work, which is sort of if, if cost of production gets low enough, which is your point about Patreon and you can produce YouTube videos, if your cost to production gets low enough and the amount of money you can somehow make is still high enough, it's sort of like, it might not work. It, it might not matter that we can't fund like really high amounts of information goods. The reason I'm a little, so to kind of respond on that one, that is a good point, but it still seems that most of, most like the level of investment in information goods is massively more than what we get out of like Patreon or Kickstarter and will remain so, you know, it involves, you know, think, think of, think of like mo most of the software we have today was funded by government in a serious way in, in, in universities at the tune of millions of dollars over many years. Um, I, I, I can imagine world maybe where we're all on UBI and we just kind of collaborate, but 
what about like the CERN super collider or you know the, 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 the scale of like investment that Google has in software development and AI um, I, I just so I kind of struggle to see that I'm not saying you were saying that covered all the examples so I just guess I'm coming back in this call for me is I'm really in search of a good answer like how do we solve the public goods problem and one answer I said is Ethereum will take over we'll need to be on it and then what I would, one thing that Ethereum didn't do, which was their mistake, but which is you'd have put a tax system into Ethereum. Using Ethereum wouldn't just pay gas fees that pay for sort of the transactions, but would have paid into a fund that funded the Ethereum ecosystem, um, which some of the DAOs do now. And that was the, but, you know, but it was one of the issues they had in, in, in DAO Ethereum V2. But I just, I still haven't quite gone to answer that. That's what I find my skepticism is that otherwise it seems just to be running on funny money at the moment, which... So, so I, 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 yeah. I don't anticipate Ethereum becoming kind of global monolithic blockchain. I think it's there's much more likely that we will have a multi-chain future with at least yeah. half a dozen blockchains, sure. probably more that are like you know useful and competitive in different ways. But to let the, um, let's go to the kibbutz. So um, kind of uh, like it's it's. Uh, so the kind of uh, the answer to that problem that I'm imagining in some way is it's not that like with it's not that the, the one guy that wasn't picking oranges gets punished it's just that everyone who was picking oranges gets a reward <laughs> you know what's gets the that. difference what's the <laughs> well, difference well yeah good question yeah exactly but is it but it is for me it is significant it's a different it's a different frame you yeah. know and like so it's not like it's no, no one's gonna no no one's gonna be you know experience any like you know meaningful like coercion or like punishment for um for like not contributing but the people that do contribute and choose to contribute are going to be recognized for that over and over again such that if you actually and just so that every the people that weren't contributing in the first place are like that looks much more fun i want to be at that party and then and they start doing it as well that's that if, if at a kibbutz level that's that's my philosophy on that problem i guess i, I also want to throw a spanner in the frame um and and you're right to bring this this question if you were dealing with a couple of diehard libertarians, um, but neither of us here have showed up with a totalitarian yeah. vision. We're not, I don't, I don't expect we're gonna replace the state anytime soon. I don't even think that's a particularly interesting thing to attempt. Mm -hmm. um, imagine everything's exactly the same as it is now, but every year when you pay your tax, instead of having one box to put your money in, you've got 15 boxes and you choose okay. where it goes. Well, okay. Right, right. So, so like it's just this, it's a very small innovation in the grand scheme of things that yeah. could make it so what i'm saying is like i think it's um tempting to imagine this like totalizing vision and that crypto gets into that like oh this new world new paradigm web3 everything is going to change i'm like no yeah. we're all these different agents with different values tugging on each other and we're going to make these little little nudge little nudge and then maybe occasional breakthroughs and I'm in it for the little nudges, you know. I don't, yeah. I don't really have this clear picture of like, hey, here's the mathematical solution to the tragedy of the commons. Like, yeah. I, I, I don't know if that's going to exist. It just to, to riff off that a little bit, like, um, I, I think one of the best ways of understanding or explaining DAOs is as blockchain-based cooperatives. Yeah. And so, like, the first thing I do is like, there are a lot of people who don't even know what a co-op is. That's also that's often my starting point. It's like, let's talk about co-ops and about how it's possible to run organizations where like people share both voting and economic rights, and that often yes. takes quite a long time. And but if you've can, if you've done that, then it's like, okay, well, like a DAO is like that where rather you're using a bank account you like you have the money locked in a smart contract on the blockchain right and like and there are and there are some like further like sort of you know specific advantages to uh, if you know to running it on the blockchain which um, i enjoy talking about like the fact they're like very easy and cheap to set up like they're fully transparent like they're censorship resistant like they're global by default and but like on the on, on from one angle it's like well if that was just co-ops on the blockchain like are they really that interesting and it's like no okay maybe but then it's but that's that to me I, when i if someone says that to me i'm like i hear them say well if like email is just like letters on the internet like is it really that interesting it's like yes. sometimes things become like a sufficiently like cross a threshold of being like cheaper and easier and faster that they yeah. change the world in ways that are extremely difficult difficult to anticipate before the fact and i i truly believe like the kind of you know post postal system to email system analogy <laughs> is very apt for the kind of co-op to dow transition that we are in the midst of right now 
I think it's a great, a great point. Um, I think, I think a couple of, I mean, this is why I think this, I mean, again, we might today be coming like to time, but there might, I don't know if there's an interesting in the episode too, just to flag some things. So I think, so what, let me kind of be also why I'm so, so, so I am so interested is, one is let's say I spent a lot of, I mean, I like my, I mean, we could go on. I mean, like my fascinating is, is kind of, it is co-optives and things like that. Obviously, again, I had this, one of my things that I've been suggesting doing didn't, maybe I didn't put in a big, good enough Twitter tea, but was to bring together like leading economists, you know, we might be able to get like a Nobel prize winner, you know, or, or but certainly some really serious mechanism design, institutional, uh, industrial organization economists, you know, and, and like people from the blockchain world and be like, hey, let's have a dialogue. Let's have a, have a summit or something because just to take an example in cooperatives. So I, the cooperatives like have a bunch, like I was very interested in platform corps. I wrote a bunch of stuff about that in, in, the, in, the, in the Open Revolution book. And I'm kind of like, let's take, let's say one example about cooperatives in the traditional world that's, I, I really love them, but what's challenging about them? Why haven't they taken over the world more? I mean, they, there are a lot of them by the way, so let's not underestimate them. Well, a classic thing in least tech stuff is that it's difficult for them to raise capital, right? Um, in the, that, uh, yeah, like they don't, they can't sell equity in the traditional sense. Now, the weird thing, and this kind of brings us to another thing that I do think is interesting about DAOs, is, well, one is they've done an end run around equity issuance laws, but that's a different discussion. But they allowed people to basically do IPOs, and, or even not even IPOs, but simply like, crowdfunding with with very little regulation but let's say that worked what's kind of interesting and it's a weird thing because there are many of them are open source but but they kind of create a new excludability right in open source anyone can use it in the classic setup of, of a system i need tokens to run on it that's what that was the whole fat through fat protocol thesis of union square ventures you couldn't traditionally fund protocols like the internet protocol because if they're open source, you sort of give out the protocol and there's no way for you to monetize. Um, and so we had the internet, which was amazing. We're funded by the US government in the 60s and, and then most of the web was funded at CERN and other places. So you know, we got that all for free and then it was just incredible. But then like Facebook proprietized sort of the protocol and the network and then various others, WhatsApp, whatever. What, block, what blockchain like or ICOs did was we could sort of like sell people like, kind of stakes in our protocol that if it was successful would be valuable because there'd be a limited set of tokens the irony is it's sort of it's and it comes back to your point by the way about community and excludability it, it's like the good thing about open source was i could leave i could fork the irony though is the value of the tokens are precisely rated because i can't fork hard forks are painful in blockchain space they're very complex, they're complex socially, they're complex economically, um, et cetera. So you create a new kind of club, the club of people who have those tokens. And this is, I mean, just going to the deeper point, I don't think you can, there's no, I guess what I'm coming from a little bit on this is like arrows and possibility theorem. There are certain things that just turn out to be hard that like there isn't a way to square the circle of. So for example, you can't have, it, you, the, the inclusivity that I hear, Stephen, you really want, and I want for the world, we all want, maybe is in the form of what we already start to have in social welfare state or in the UBI. No one will be coerced in the sense they will be, they will be locked up in prison, they will be made to go hungry, they will be exiled, they will be socially cut off. We want a world in which everyone has the basics, and the basics are not just food and shelter, but like love and connection and uh, support and the things that we want. At the same time, there's this question of until we're all like transformed bodhisattvas, we still have to deal with the free rider problem. One way to deal with it, and I am very interested in this, we all become, you know, we're part of a culture that's like bodhisattva-like, you know, that we really discover our love for others, you know, like, and, and I'm not, that's partly what Christianity did. Christianity transformed altruism, at least within its own community, you know, that we have had major step changes in human love for each other and connection with each other mm -hmm. but i am and i'm kind of any of the question to you is to say but what we might not call it coercion but these these dow systems sort of create these club goods including this like airdrop on the early people you know the people who hold bitcoins now if they really do succeed they'll be like they'll be the originals you know like yeah. in, in in you know the people who got land in 200 years 
and there's no way around that that there's, there, there seems to be there's no way around those kind of problems if we really make it open to all we have the free rider problem if we make club goods we're excluding some people and we are essentially maybe we're not using coercion but we're doing something and i think that's what i'm looking for is a bit more of an honest thing of those trade-offs in the space and a real inquiry into the public goods funding problem that that's what i'm still a little searching for i guess for me so something that came up for me there was um well, as, first I'll say I'm, I'm also extremely interested in the kind of cultural piece, the kind of inner transformation piece. Um, it's, as I know Rich is, this is like an essential part of the puzzle. But um, something like, um, so far as like you know, money is something like the, just the, 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 and our money system is like the water that we, that we swim in. Like, and um, we, um it's it's foundational to everything about the the economy and um imagine that we do have a a, a world full of bodhisattvas if we if we if if our, if our only option was still like the dollar and the pound and money systems that have like <laughs> like in, you know just uh are, are kind of inequality and inequity like built into them um, then uh, we'd still potentially be in like a kind of like sticky situation. Whereas, it, whereas now we have the possibility, like if people do decide that actually what matters to me is, is love, is equality, is the health of the planet, we now have the possibility for them to create and adopt new money systems that much more accurately like capture and, and reflect that set of values in a way, whereas before, you know, like the option of, okay, shall we use pounds or dollars or euros is like not much of an option. Like they're, they're all equally bad. Whereas now we can say, you know what, I'm actually going to start earning, using, transacting in Klima tokens or UBI tokens or what, you know, or regen tokens or seeds projects, which, which like truly resonate with like, you know, like some of my deepest values. And that to me is an enormously exciting possibility. And, and, you know, really shows that, yes, it's not just about technology. It's like technology is exciting because it exists, but it's, it's only like, um, you know, it's only really of any long-term utility if we change ourselves as, you know, or as human beings and then choose to make the appropriate choice and this is not like exactly an innovative thing to say you know people say, you know it's a beautiful thing is just, technology is just a tool of course you know just like you know the you know like nuclear physics is it's, just, it's really about how we we use it whether we're making kind of like clean nuclear sy energy systems for the world or whether we're producing nuclear bombs and i absolutely see there's a sim there is that risk with blockchain technology it absolutely could be an utterly totalizing technology that institutes like horrifically dystopian social credit systems across you know the the entire world or by some world government that are tracking our every purchase like yes <laughs> possible um, but it's also possible that we use that technology in the name of, of love of freedom to and to really capture that which is most important to us i'm with you and i mean both of you <laughs> I, I really appreciate the um, yeah the honesty that you're bringing to the questions, Rufus, and I really I feel I feel two different kind of um, just sitting here seeing these two faces on my screen. It's like two different flavors of love, you know, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> that they have a different orientation, and and we need both of them. And I think that one of the main points that I'm trying to drive home here is um we'll figure these things out in connection with each other yeah. and and i've seen so much allergic repulsion you know like <laughs> uh, uh distance and, I, and i'm really grateful that both of you are have sufficient qualities and values in common that we can meet and ask these hard questions because mostly there's been a real lack of intelligent critique going on and actually just in the last couple of months it's, it feels like there's a sea change coming on where people are starting to engage intelligently. Like the really recent one from um, Moxie Mullenspike, there's been a few coming out of critiques. So you're like, yeah, this is a really good question. Thank you for asking. Uh, where we're treating each other as mutually dignified and intelligent humans worthy of respect rather than assuming I'm the good one and you're the bad one. Like that's basically what I'm advocating for and for people to just 
think twice into like, hey, we're having a really good time over here. Do you want to come visit? And maybe we'll make some useful exchanges rather than to say like, this crypto team is the right team and you're all on the wrong team. And if you just join the right team, everything's going to be fine. Like, I just really don't want to play that game. Which also doesn't like, um, as someone kind of in the crypto world, like it doesn't make any sense to say that really, because it's, this is, this technology is still so early stage. Like half of it doesn't even really work yet. You know, it's like, it's ridiculous how early this is. And I think like there are, there are like some like vocal crypto advocates that make like, do a good job at making people think like it's here and it's arrived and like no it's like there's there's so much to make so much to build so many like important decisions to make around like yeah how you know the direction this technology goes and i think it's one of the things that um i, I said to rich in the past which i think sort of and it, that resonated with you is like and, and kind of what you're saying now is like much better that we bring like as many possible like good-hearted intelligent humans like into the mix now to, to to, so that we give we give it our best shot that this technology does move in the right direction on the basis that there's some kind of shared recognition of okay this shit is powerful like and it's gonna you know it's gonna be with us in one form or another for good and like better that we all try to steer it in the direction that of of, of the common good rather than it be uh you know captured for the benefit of of a few and that's that's the kind of invitation i make to perhaps people listening to this and and to yeah you. I mean, you're already you're already there really but like but like yeah just like let's let, let yeah let's let's keep talking like there's, there's there's plenty of interesting opportunities like if you don't like it you can leave again you know what's what's the worst that can happen <laughs> what's the worst can happen exactly well i don't know i mean so i want to maybe we, it's a good point uh today to to wrap up i don't know if we i, I would love i think there's, there's still stuff we haven't covered and maybe one of the things would be what i, what I really hear maybe the invitation at the end is like in steven your comment just there is how how can we, how can, and I don't mean just, I, when I say we, I'm not referring to this group here, but, but how can people maybe who are interested in that way, what is it we can do to kind of, as it were, I guess, bring a gravitational pull uh, to, towards like the good or like more, the real rigorous, the, the not, it's not just, it, it, it's, not, it's not about getting rich, it's about um, the world getting, it's about, you know, it's about transformation of our systems. Maybe that, I don't want to go into that now, but I think that was the invitation I heard kind of at the end is us to reflect on that maybe more deeply. And then my involvement is going into these kind of questions about how, how does the public good funding work? Or, you know, um, for me, like one big one is like, what is it that has us like this so much versus traditional political engagement? Um, you know, I always reckon if we were 40 years ago, I don't know, or something, we'd have all been like joining you know, I don't know, we'd have been joining some activist movement and we probably all did ourselves about 10, 20, 50 years. But that's an interesting question for me as well, like our kind of cultural social state that some of you touched on. I don't know whether we'll have a second one, but just for now, I just really, it's been a real pleasure. And that note of Stevens to end on and Rich's, I think of like, how can we, how can one shape this space for, in a, in a well way? How can we contribute in a useful way? Uh, that seems a really good point to reflect on. Thank you so much, Rufus, for initiating this dialogue. And yeah, I'm hoping that we can create some kind of forum, even if it's just like a Telegram group or whatever, where people that are uh, yeah interested in this conversation can can find each other, and we can yeah, keep these kind of things going. Yeah, okay. I'm grateful and up for some more. Um, I I, I want to give a shout out um, if to anyone listening, like if you want to get further in, it's just about finding the other people that that resonate with your values that are participating in the scene that you don't find completely off-putting. Um, so if you like what I've been talking about, play with me on Twitter, Rich Decibels. If you like what steven has been talking about, he's got amazing crypto courses, go with him. If you're looking for something else, go to Rabbit Hole or go to Kernel. Like there's so many places now that are opening out the red carpet to welcome people in. And there's some really good people. There's some really good friends that are waiting for you. Um, not because you're going to get magic money, even though that might happen, but because there's just like very curious, open-hearted, compassionate, enthusiastic, optimistic people. And it's just, it's so energizing to be around optimistic people. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. And, and yeah, you can find us. I think all of our search for us, whether it's Twitter or online, they're a place to find us. We might, we put this out somewhere. Okay. I'm going to stop the recording at that moment. Thanks everyone. And tune in. We hope maybe there'll be a next episode.